Okay, thanks a lot for the opportunity to talk here. Uh, so this talk will be a status report on the uh, program which we started uh, about five years ago with Rafael Flager and Viktor Garbenka and then continued also with the help of Guzman Hernandez, Shifle, who is here, and with Merdad Merbabai and other folks li listed here. Uh, so uh, the main question, the main goal of this pro pro program is to uh, read off from the experiment uh, the answer to the question, what is the solution of pure glue in large and limit. Uh, well, some, more, more precisely, we kind of know the answer to this question. It's supposed to be a theory of free strings. So really, the question is, uh, can we solve this free string theory? What is the corresponding uh, Wolchitz theory? Uh, and well, usually when one talks about experiment in particle physics nowadays, it looks something like this. Uh, so in our, in our case, it's quite different. So there are just three folks here uh, shown on the slide. And the experiment is really a computer simulation, so I'm talking about lattice QCD. But I would like to emphasize that if not for these three people, well, the subject would be really dead. Uh, and it's these guys who are doing all the hard work. We are just having fun here. Uh, so, well, to make this question more tractable, let's divide it into two parts. So first part is uh, let's try to understand uh, what is the Volschitz theory of an infinitely long string. Uh, and after we understand the end, then one may hope to go further and study this kind of what one usually means by solving glue dynamics in large and limit, say spectrum of short strings uh, glue balls. And also this division is guided by how uh, lattice uh, simulations work as well as, as we'll see momentarily. Uh, so to uh, just uh, to start with, uh, let me be a bit more precise by what I mean. Uh, by Wolchitz theory to make sure, sure that really I'm talking about object which exists and uh, well defined. Uh, so if I start, start theory with like pure glue dynamics, which is confining theory with a gap and has unbroken center symmetry, then I can, can consider a break, background where there is infinitely long flux tube created by infinitely long Wilson line stretches through all of the space time. So in such a background, at high energies, of course, I have 4D theory, but at low energies below the gap, all excitations are localized on the string, and so I'm dealing with effective two-dimensional theory with the cutoff set by the inverse tension of the string. Uh, so that's already an interesting setting, but it becomes much more interesting at large n, because what happens at large n that the probability of string inter interconnections go to zero. So uh, this two-dimensional theory gets decoupled from four-dimensional theory. So if I take the large n limit keeping energy fixed, that uh, eventually I get microscopic two-dimensional theory. And this is the main object which I'm talking about, and this is what I, I call Wolchitz theory of a QCD string. Uh, well, and I strongly feel that that may be the most interesting object in QCD. Uh, but maybe other people here have different opinions. Uh, so, but uh, it, also it's important to have in mind that uh, in this limit, so the physical cutoff of this two-dimensional theory goes to infinity, i.e. the scale at which production of bulk states becomes unsuppressed. But on the other hand, this two-dimensional theory it, uh, it is strongly coupled at the same scale 1 over LS. So it's interesting two-dimensional theory, which is strongly coupled in UV, but it's microscopically well-defined theory. Uh, so, and, well, not only is microscopically well-defined, but we have also instrumental, operational, non-perturbative definition of this theory by doing lattice simulations uh, with large and larger number of colors. In principle, one can measure uh, arbitrary observable in this theory with arbitrary precision. Uh, and so the most na natural observable which Lattice provides for us is the finite volume spectrum of this theory by measuring two-point function of Polyakov loops, I mean strings which wrap around compact dimension. So this is the pic typical picture which comes out from Lattice simulation. So this is the length of the string, and these are energies of different excited states. And already staring in this picture, you can see certain things. First, well, you, s you can see that you're really dealing with a string. So the, all these energies are linear in the limit when uh, 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 length becomes large. Uh, and also, while well, there is this interesting pseudo-scalar excitation, so these are quantum numbers with respect to rotation around long string with, with, with respect to O2. So this uh, excitation, one can see, it go goes almost parallel to the ground state. Uh, so that looks as if I started with a string and added a massive excitation on the wall sheet. That's how what would like this picture. And this actually, that feeling is correct. So that's what this uh, state is. It's a massive excitation on the wall sheet uh, of the string. Uh, so, well, uh, that's most direct thing which Lattice provides for us, but also one can do other fun games with this. One can go from this finite volume spectrum and extract, using thermodynamic beta and that techniques, one can extract scattering phase shift on the Volt sheet. So, to go from Euclidean picture to kind of Minkowski one, 
Uh, and that's, for instance, how it looks like uh, for this is 3D young males now. Uh, so uh, to summarize what we know currently from this kind of measurements for, uh, for, for about long strings, uh, so at the summary will be both for d equal 4 and d equal 3. So for d equal 4, we currently know well, we see three modes. So one, two of them are obvious ones. These are just translational uh, massless excitations of the string. Another in this uh, massive to the scalar mode, which I just showed for you before. Uh, and uh, for this mode, we, well, there is a measurement of its mass in string units. And also one can measure, uh, determine from lattice data, the leading uh, to the scalar coupling of this mode to string uh, Goldstone excitation is given by this number. Uh, so for d equal 3, uh, at the moment, all what one sees is just a single Goldstone massless excitation. So there is no sign in the current data uh, of the, uh, any massive modes. Uh, so that's kind of the current uh, experimental situation uh, as far as theory of long string goes. So that doesn't sound like a lot. But actually, what I will try to convince you now that already with this data, one may make uh, well, hopefully non-crazy ansatz for how the Volchitz theory may look like. And to see that one uh, should kind of ask certain theoretical question and see that the, this data may be more telling than it looks like. Well, and the question is like that. So, well, other examples of confining theories where a Volchitz theory defined above is integrable. So, well, wh why to ask this question? Well, first, but to get an idea of what one might expect. And in general, so if this is a situation where you have na natural two-dimensional theory associated to four-dimensional theory. And whenever you see two-dimensional theory, it's natural to ask whether it can be integrable. Uh, but at least personally for me, major motivation was coming from what we just heard from Pedro. So by now we know that there are examples of conformal uh, high-dimensional theories which are integrable, like n equal 4 and ABGM. So it's interesting to ask, are there integrable confining theories? And well, to ask this question, first you need to define what you mean by confining theory, integrable confining theory in high dimensions. And uh, this just provides a natural definition for, for, for what that would be. Well, and finally, uh, well, QC, one may expect QCD string to be somewhat simple in the UV because at the end QCD is asymptotically free theory. So here we took funny limit by fixing the energy and taking large n limit first, but one may hope that still some remnant of this simplicity remains in this limit in the Volchitz theory. And in two dimensions, simple usually means integrable. Uh, so well, let's uh, start addressing like somewhat simpler question and. Uh, because also motivated by the fact that in QCD we know that the only massless excitations are Goldstone bosons, transverse modes. So the question is, well, can a theory of Goldstones only of this kind can be integrable? And the answer is, in principle, yes, at 26 dimensions or at three dimensions. So in both cases, the uh, corresponding S matrix, the corresponding phase shift is uh, uh, completely fixed by word identities of nonlinearized Poincaré symmetry. Uh, plus integrability and takes this, this form. So if one uh, takes this phase shift <coughs> and calculates corresponding finite volume spectrum that, for instance, at d equal 26, one, one finds this formula and one immediately recognizes this is a spectrum of uh, critical bosonic string. Uh, so that's one way uh, to define what critical bosonic string theory is. Uh, in any other number of dimensions, one finds that uh, uh, the theory is uh, integrable at classical level, it's number got action, but at one loop level there is uh, universal particle production, so in integrability is broken. So there is kind of anomaly here, uh, and as always with anomalies, it's uh, natural to ask what kind of massless states one can add to the theory to restore integrability. And the simplest option would be to add an uh, additional uh, scalar particle on the volt sheet, and then one can write part coupling like this. And uh, choosing appropriate value of this coupling, one can find that actually indeed integrability can be restored, and one gets uh, the same S matrix. Uh, and what's written here is just a very complicated way to arrive at something which is very well known. Of course, this is linear dilaton background, and this is conventional path to non-critical strings. However, we just saw that it looks like gluodynamics didn't take this path. We don't see any sign of a scalar particle there. In, in four dimensions, we see a sign of pseudo-scalar. It turns out there is another simple option which exists at d equal 4 to restore integrability. Namely, one can add a massless pseudo-scalar particle and write this leading uh, order operator, pseudo-scalar operator. Uh, and similarly, how it happens for linear dilaton, for the special value of the coupling, uh, one can construct build integrable theory with the same S matrix with additional massless pseudo-scalar particle. So now here comes the surprise. Uh, so this value which follows from integrability turn out to agree within error bars, which is the level of 10%, uh, 
uh, with the value which was in, uh, previously determined from lattice data for massive axion, uh, which, which, is, which is seen in QCD. Uh, so, well, that's definitely puzzling. Uh, and so, well, this experimental summary uh, for long strings then can be formulated in the following way. So both at d equals 3 and 4, uh, the meta content of the uh, series which we find, two, two goldstones and one pseudoscalar and one goldstone, uh, coincides with the meta content of a possible integrable theory. Uh, so in both cases, well, we see that there is a deformation. In four dimensions, this pseudoscalar is massive. In three dimensions, one can see from data that the theory is not integrable. Uh, Furthermore, there is this suggestive numerology about the value of the coupling. So, of course, it all can be just a coincidence in numerology, but I think it's fun to take it somewhat seriously. And the natural uh, uh, thing to do then uh, is to say, well, uh, maybe it's telling us that Volchitz theory of QCD string is the deformation of these integrable theories, which we find at d equals 3 and d equals 4. So, in other words, uh, kind of the straw man ansatz which one can make. Uh, given this data, it's what we call axionic string ansatz, so it can be formulated in universal dimension, universal way in the following uh, sense. So QCD string is a deformation of integrable theory of goldstones plus uh, a pseudoscalar excitation on the whole sheet of a string, well, uh, anti-Semitic tensor with respect to transverse rotations. So it equals four, that this is the same as having a pseudoscalar. It equals three, it's the same as not adding any local excitations on the whole sheet. Uh, and so in the remainder of my talk, I will uh, focus on this d equal to 3 case because it's simpler theoretically, uh, but also uh, from the point of view of lattice data, it's, uh, there is more data there. Uh, uh, and uh, what I will try to do now, well, the initial thing to test how these ansatz can be tested, but now we we'll, would we'll like to look at the spectrum of globals and ask, well, whether they look like that, whether globals look as excitation d equals 3, whether they look like excitation of just a, a theory in the equivalence class of Nambugota theory without any, um, any uh, additional degrees of freedom on the vault sheet. Uh, so I will not try to predict the mass spectrum of globals, but uh, I will just try to see whether the quantum numbers, which in three dimensions just it's spin parity and charge conjugation, whether they look like quantum numbers of string excitations. Uh, and well, of course, it would be nice to have a covariant action for the string to do this exercise. And up until recently, we didn't have such an action. I will show it at the end, uh, very end of the talk. I'll show you the candidate for this action. Uh, but actually, one can go uh, f make some progress without, well, without having such an action. Well, mainly the observation is, well, if you talk about strings, well, the first thing you may expect, you may expect to have stru stru find structure like this. You may to, uh, find multiplets of states labeled by level uh, and such that at each level, uh, one will, will find a tensor product structure, so something which can be naturally written as a tensor product. So let's look at the, uh, well, and that implies some simple multiplication table of what one can get at each level. Uh, so there is simple O2 representation theory uh, going on here. Uh, so let's look at the actual spectrum. So this is a spectrum of uh, d equals 3 Jan Mills, mentioned by uh, Mike Tepper last summer. Uh, it, it, it's it extrapolated to infinite n. Uh, so what, and uh, indeed one finds one sees group of states which may naturally be described, described like that. So here it's n equals 0, n equals 1, n equals 2. So actually this, this groups there just uniquely can be written as this uh, uh, tensor squares. Uh, at n equals 3, there is, uh, I made some spin arrangement, arrangements here. Some of the states here, the spin determination is not, is only mod z, z4. Uh, which is a lattice symmetry, so some of these states n equals 3, they don't have spin determinations yet, and also three states are missing here from what we would expect. But anyway, there is a unique way to uh, com complete what one sees at this level in the uh, tensor, tensor square, uh, and so the answer, well, comes something like this. So for instance, this is a multiplicity which one finds, 1, 4, 9, uh, 25. Uh, now the observation is that, well, actually, there is a way to get these numbers. So here we just see that there are multiplets. But there is a so, so following uh, curious way to get these numbers. Uh, so let's make the following ansatz, which to a right, large extent motivated what we see in critical strings. So in critical strings, uh, this h left and h right, this uh, Hilbert spaces, uh, they're the same as Hilbert space of an open string. So let's say it's the same. And then, so let's focus on the Hilbert space of open string. And for open string, we can decompose it as a sum of Sub, subspaces with uh, fixed value of angular momentum. Now, at large j, 
we know how this SJ look like because there is a simple classical solution rotating rod and we can just look at the uh, spectrum of excitations around this classical solution and we construct this Hilbert space at, at large J and let's just close our eyes and say that uh, well, the same structure which one has there, it, it works for all J's. Uh, well, this is a very brave thing to do, but it turns out if one does that, that one exactly reproduces the numbers which I, I showed you on the previous table. Uh, so somehow this theory it looks that semi-classics works in this theory better than what we could expect. So it's suggestive maybe of some underlying localization story. Uh, so, uh, well, of course, one would like, as I already said, one would like to be able to go beyond these heuristics. And for that, one needs to find a tractable path integral formulation of this uh, theory I'm talking about here. So it's a theory, uh, so in D equals 3, the in underlying integrable theory is a theory of a single massless boson with uh, this S matrix. Well, of course, kind of, we, we know there is some action principle for this. It's this S matrix is a quantization of uh, Nambugot action, but, well, this doesn't look like a uh, tractable uh, action to put it in the path integral. Uh, so we want to find something better. We want to find analog of Polyakov formalism for, for this non-critical string. Uh, and uh, so to explain uh, wh where this may come from, where it comes from, uh, let me uh, tell you about some somewhat more general construction which we came across a few years ago with uh, Victor and Merdad. Uh, namely, turns out that one can start with arbitrary quantum field theory in two dimensions. Well, it should be relativistic, otherwise it can be completely arbitrary, doesn't need to be integrable, doesn't need to be conformal. And then the observation was that if one starts with such a, uh, with such a theory and considers a st uh, set of its sc uh, scattering amplitudes, and then builds a new S matrix given by this dressing formula, so multiplies by them by certain phases, uh, where these P, PIs are on shell two momenta, and there is natural ordering on the momenta in two dimensional series de de determined by the ordering by rapidities, how they enter the causal di diamond. Uh, so then the observation was that this new dress test matrix uh, it's also satisfies all the, all the properties which you want this matrix to satisfy. Uh, and uh, so that's. Uh, give some deformation of the theory. And last year, actually, this deformation was reformulated in the operator language as TT bar deformation by Smirnov and Zamalochikov and uh, Tateo with collaborators. And so my, the theory we're after is a particular case of this deformation when one starts just a, with a single free, free massless boson. So the question is, uh, so we're in an unusual situation here. Usually in physics, we start with the action and look for S matrix. So here we start with, started with S matrix, and now we're looking for the action which describes this theory. Uh, and the hint uh, well, what the action could be came from recent developments uh, related to SYK model. But uh, yeah, so actually let me tell you one more thing which is useful to keep in mind. So for this phase shift which, uh, which provides this dressing, one can write it as a path integral of the certain boundary quantum, Chern-Simons quantum mechanics, which kind of quantum mechanics describing particle moving in the magnetic field in, in two dimensions. So there is this way to write this, this phase shift, it's just a fact. Uh, now as I said, the uh, inspiration for what the action could be came from recent development in near ads 2 holography. Uh, and basically the point is that this whole story which I told to you now sounds very similar to what happens there. So there the claim is you start with a theory, quantum field theory in rigid ADS2 space, uh, and then you can calculate boundary correlators which are analog of S matrix elements for in flat space. Uh, and then uh, the statement is the coupling of that re uh, quantum field theory to jacquif tatelboim gravity can be described as just coupling uh, the boundary correlators to the boundary quantum mechanics, which in that case is given by Schwarzen theory. So the whole theory, the whole s s chain uh, looks very similar to what uh, we, we did in, uh, in uh, two dimensions. So the natural guess was that maybe, well, if one takes flat space limit of jacquif tatelboim gravity, then that would be the action formulation for that S matrix, that gravitational dressing which I presented for you. Actually, actually there is a, another reason to expect this. So if you look at the, uh, the, the jacquif tatelboim gravity in flat space limit, so this phi, you may think about it as a Lagrange multiplier which forces metric to be flat. So that means, well, really the path integral schematically becomes a path integral of a flat metric. And then uh, the vacuum energy of the initial theory, well, it becomes a total derivative, which exactly gives this uh, chern simons uh, thank you, quantum boundary, uh, boundary quantum mechanics, which I uh, showed to you before. So this is heuristic argument. Uh, now, actually, 
one can prove that this expectation is correct. And the key point in the, in the proof is to uh, well, understand the answer to this, so the following question. So, well, jacquif tatelboim gravity in flat space, this is the vacuum of the theory. Metric is flat, but uh, Dilaton has this quadratic profile. So naively it breaks shift symmetry. So why would one expect to find Poincaré invariant S metrics on the first hand? Uh, and the answer is that if one goes to, well, it's easier to see in conformal gauge. So if one goes to conformal gauge, then the action takes this form. And this action, in addition to translations of space-time coordinates, it's also invariant under Galilean shifts acting on the dilaton. Uh, and so the, uh, this whole theory, this vacuum, is invariant under diagonal transformation with shift coordinates and, and the dilaton. Uh, so this suggests that, well, actually, to, to get this S matrix, one should uh, kind of introduce dynamical coordinates which are related to the dilaton field. So these are uh, just the derivative of the dilaton field in the conformal gauge. So on the vacuum, they are coincided with uh, sigma coordinates, uh, but also they shift properly under physical Poincare symmetry, which uh, leaves uh, vacuum invariant here. So after uh, these observations, the rest is straightforward. So uh, well, in conformal gauge, Matter doesn't feel anything. Matter propagates unperturbed in this theory. One solves for field equations now for uh, this y, which are coordinate per perturbations. One looks at this as a dynamical, uh, as a oper operator equations. <coughs> and then, uh, well, the solutions then can be written as the following form. So if you have a bunch of uh, colliding particles that in the in region, for instance, uh, this uh, uh, operators y can be written as like for a given particle. Uh, one can uh, write this operator as a difference between momentum of the particles on the left and on the right of these particles. Uh, and then, uh, so with this solution at, 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 at hand, and the same one can do for, for, out par for outgoing particles, then one just well, follows what, what S matrix is. So before gravity is introduced, one can do Fourier decomposition of uh, fields, one finds uh, creation and relation operators. Uh, so this prescription that one should use dynamical coordinates to define uh, 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 the theory tells us that after gravity is introduced, actually the uh, physical creation and equation operators are shifted by exponential factors like this. Uh, and that means that the rest in states related to initial in states, uh, well, by this extra exponential factor, the same for out states. The sign is different here because for out states, particles anti ordered according to their rapidity in the space. And then one just takes matrix element between in and out states and finds this matrix which I wrote to you before. So one finds exactly this dressing. So the whole role of this topological Jacquif Taylor sector in this theory is to provide a set of dynamical coordinates for this theory. And if one uses these coordinates as clock and rods in the theory of gravity, one finds this dressed, uh, this dressed S matrix. So I should also say that this is an interesting setup where, uh, well, we can, because we started from thinking about Schwartz. And so this is an interesting setup when I can actually take exactly the flat space limit of ADS2 holography. So one can try to reproduce the same S matrix starting from uh, ADS2 description. Uh, and uh, on the way, we came across uh, some a uh, very simple version of the kind of holographical Z formula, the expression for flat space S matrix in terms of boundary oper uh, correlators. So essentially, all what one need to do for massive scattering, one need in Euclidean signature, one put uh, op operators at the positions where kind of the angle around the boundary is given equal to the rapidity of the incoming particles. And then if one takes this limit, then one gets the flat space S matrix in the limit when delta going to infinity, because that's what flat space is limit, as we heard earlier uh, from Jao today. Uh, so there is a small surprise here. So it turns out one does get the correct S matrix, but uh, to get the correct S matrix and actually to get unitary S matrix at all, the Schwarzen prescription has to be so somewhat extended. So one needs to integrate, in addition, one needs to integrate over the coupling of the Schwarzen theory, which correspond to integrating over the size of the circle in the, in the, uh, of the boundary circle. So it's a kind of a modulus which was fixed, fixed in, this, uh, in the standard uh, uh, near the S2 story. So if one doesn't integrate out over that modulus, uh, then in the flat space limit, one doesn't get unitary S matrix. But if one do, does this additional integration, uh, then one reproduces unitary S matrix, well, which is exactly in the flat space limit, which is exactly the S matrix which I uh, showed to you before. Uh, so I should say, well, that kind of this operation looks a bit 
non-local, and actually it looks reminiscent of what one expects from Euclidean wormholes, kind of the coupling constant here becomes dynamical, but one can use different gauge. One can go in static gauge, so when you use just the angle in, uh, in the, in the in Poincare disk as your coordinate, in that gauge, uh, the, kind of the result in action is completely local, and actually imposing the constraint that the size of the circle is fixed, uh, it's a non-local operation, but, it's, but one checks that in this gauge, one gets the same, the same answer for the flat space uh, S matrix. So one final comment unrelated to QCD, uh, and probably unrelated to anything, but I can't refrain from making it, is the following. So well, actually, this Jacob Tate-Liborian gravity is a curious example of what people who didn't give up on trying to find a dynamical solution to cosmological constant problem, these people uh, call it degravitating theory. Namely, a vacuum energy in this theory doesn't result in the, doesn't curve space-time because phi is a Lagrange multiplier which uh, forces uh, space-time to be flat no matter what you do. So there is no, uh, like if a cosmological constant here doesn't affect cosmology, uh, but instead uh, it results in the, one gets flat space theory but uh, what one would expect to be IR quantity becomes a UV quantity. So uh, the uh, string tension actually is set by the vacuum energy uh, of the series. So this modification uh, of scattering in the UV, uh, the LS minus 2 is given by the vacuum energy of Jackie of tate uh, gravity. So well, it's curious, I don't know exactly what to do with this. Okay, so I'm coming uh, to the end of my talk. Uh, so well, the summary is, I think, well, one of the most interesting things here, that lattice QCD provides a rare experimental window into quantum gravity. Well, it's two-dimensional quantum gravity, but it's quantum gravity, and also we know that theory is not integrable. It's a deformation of uh, integrable theory we're talking about. So it may be really interesting quantum gravity. So, well, large part of my life, I thought, I thought there is nothing more boring than QCD, and when one thinks about QCD, there is nothing more boring QCD than lattice QCD. And for the last five years, I was working things closely relect, uh, related to lattice QCD. So, and I think this is the reason why uh, I could have, well, there are other reasons, but that's one reason why that could have been wrong. Uh, well, furthermore, uh, well, young milk globals walk, talk, and quark, quark as closed strings, at least in three dimensions. That's hardly a surprise, probably, which is more surprising that the resulting theory, uh, non-critical string theory, so far looks uh, pretty minimalistic. Uh, and finally, we have a promising tractable action for an integral approximation to this Volchitz theory in three dimensions, which is just uh, Jackie tate boheim gravity uh, coupled to a single uh, massless boson. And, well, given that, I hope that we're approaching the stage when the progress can be made just by theorists on their own. However, still, the input and sanity check from Lattice is very, very welcome and appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kobe. So, so there about uh, the, the global spectrum that you showed with, uh, with this radiative trajectory, what is the intercept that you get there, and what is the slope? Is the slope half the one of uh, open string, uh, in, and the intercept is twice? Well, yeah, so there is a b bit of a puzzle here. So indeed, if you look at this plot, well, it looks like something which looks nice, linear trajectory. Uh, but yeah, the slope, uh, if I remember correctly, the slope is uh, uh, kind of 30% different from what one would expect, uh, it's, uh, which is, I'm a bit puzzled by that, but also we're really t talking about here very low line states, so it can g get fixed, but uh, uh, yeah, so, but then it would be coincidence that these po points tend to uh, be on the straight line, so there is a puzzle here. On the other hand, if kind of one factorizes their, uh, their uh, overall factor, yeah, the intercept here, it's actually very close to it, this, this line grows very close to minus one, the, the, if, if I remember correctly. So, is there, but again, within 10, 15 percent. So there is room, as usual with data, there is room for lots of numerology. So maybe this whole talk is based on some numerology. But um, yeah, uh, Mukund. Yeah. So the, the expression issue for the modified S matrix, it's very reminiscent of non-commutative modifications. If you truncate to the planar sector for scattering amplitudes? Yeah, is, so is there some connection? It, it, well, it is, it is similar, but there is are several important differences. First, in non commutative field series, one gets factors like that at tree level, and then one calculates Feynman diagrams with them. Here, it's directly at the 
uh, is that is the level of exact amplitude. But even probably more important difference, because that would be space-time non-commutativity, and that usually leads to problems with causality. But the reason for that is that when after one sums over color, color orderings, then one gets this kind of factors with, with different signs. So here, if I flip sign, that it would produce time advance rather than time delay. However, here, it's, just, it's only time delay, so there is only one sign. So it is similar, but I think it's, 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 it's different. Uh, when you say that, uh, when you say that uh, this uh, model is an approximation, it, it, this is an, do you mean that there is like a small parameter in young mills theory which you can change and for which you would get an exactly integrable world chip theory? Uh, well, no, of course we don't have such a parameter in, in glue dynamics. So, but yeah, so there is no obvious parameter like that. But, but basically, the expectation is like when I m mean that it's a deformation, I mean. Uh, that this numerology with coupling constant may be indication that uh, the theory becomes integrable in the UV, re reflecting asymptotic freedom of QCD, perhaps. And actually, this phase shift, it has very simple uh, physical meaning. So it's just telling us that the time delay is in the scattering is proportional to energy of the scatter particles which, which scatter, which almost a definition of what relativistic string is, because for relativistic string, uh, length, geometric length is proportional to the energy of the excitation. So it wouldn't be crazy that that uh, kind of universal UV asymptotics of, uh, on the world sheet. Uh, and also in IR theory becomes integrable uh, because well, just as a consequence of symmetries, because there is everything dominated by number gota. So, by the to tell that it's deformation, well, it's a meaning that it's some uh, kind of intermediate phenomenon at, like, at energies of all the lambda QCD. Now, the question are we lucky that we will manage to find some parameter of order one which we can expand? That's a very good question, because really, well, to do expansion, one doesn't necessarily need to have a small parameter. It can be Largest, but if the radius of convergence is, 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 is if you have within radius of convergence, one can do still expand. But okay, uh, now uh, Juan. Yeah. So uh, you you may if if you put just the face, there is you said it was integrable, and we can understand what background it corresponds to in string theory. The, that full theory, that's the string with the dilaton background. Now, is there a similar interpretation for the string with the axion? So if you have the axion, and you mentioned that there was an integrable theory that had this axion particle. Right. And if I understood you correctly, if you set it massless, then you expect it to be integrable. Is that correct? Well, when, when it's massless, well, we have very ugly and hopefully correct the grammatic proof that the theory is really integrable. Uh, okay, yeah. fine. So there is, yeah. uh, that's an integrable background, and presumably it should correspond to some exact string background that I guess one should uh, find. Do you know what uh, this, uh, this background is? Yeah, but... Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. That's a very good question, yeah. Um, uh, Igor, uh, next, next door. <coughs> yeah, this seems reminiscent to C equal 1 coupled to some version of 2D quantum gravity, right? So I was wondering, can you do C higher, and is there some version of the barrier? Like, do you expect some tachyon problem to...? Well, so you mean uh, this Jack Heath and uh, action which I wrote here? So, well, in principle, well, we can consider an arbitrary number of bosons yeah. here. Suppose you take more, th more fields, will you so, get So, yeah, actually, for if I took d minus two bosons here, so the, the, mm -hmm. the claim would be that this theory, at the kind of, well, it's, 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 it's S matrix is all, always given by this e to the s, and uh, so for a d minus two, uh, for any number of d minus two bosons, classically, this theory would be equivalent to number gotter, but only for d equals three and sorry, for d equal 1 and for d equal uh, 24, uh, that this classical Poincare symmetry, or for this theory it's quantum, but somehow, well, it's, uh, so, so oh, anyway, so it's only for d equal 1 or 24 bosons here uh, that this theory also has, uh, the quantum level has exact target space Poincare symmetry. And you're right, it looks superficially, it, like, it looks like C equal 1 theory, but I think it, it's really, it's, in the standard counting, it's more, it's, it's, it's more like C, C equals three, because it really it's a three-dimensional string. So, and one way to see what's going on, it, it's for, for how at D equal 26, how to see uh, that this theory is equivalent to, uh, to Polyakov string. So one may think, well, this uh, phi R coupling, when we think about is a delta function, conformal gauge, it's a delta function which fixes D squared omega to be equal to zero, where omega is the while factor of the metric. So it's just different way of fixing their uh, while symmetry. 
And this D squared there, it produces a determinant which usually comes from X0 and X1. So one can see that this theory is indeed a D equal so, so you're picking up two extra dimensions. Yes, yeah, so there are two extra dimensions here which are hidden in the dilaton is field. Is there some sense that once you go above, above three, there will be a problem with this action? Or uh, like no, the hope is that exactly kind of this, uh, this theory avoids problem of non usual non-critical strings. And kind of because those problems arise from, arise from Liouville mode. And here, this dilaton, it acts as a Lagrange multiplier, which kind of kills most of the level dyna dynamics. Okay. So that's, okay. that's, uh, that's really, uh, that's the hope. Okay. We'll do one more, Kostya. Uh. If your dressing phase as written seems to break parity because it uh, contains epsilon, but it, it shouldn't in principle. Sorry? Or, so the, the dressing phase you wrote, um, on one of the previous slides, when you deform the S matrix? Yeah. Uh, um, in, in it contains an epsilon symbol, so it seems to break parity. No, no, it is parity invariant. This epsilon symbol, it essentially just produces correct cut structure. So you, one can explicitly, that's what, how we, one of the checks we're doing in the because initially we just guessed this is matrix, but when we checked that one can reproduce it by just doing loop calculations from local Lagrangians. So this theory is parity invariant. So this epsilon, for instance, I said for single massless bosons, this formula reduces just to e, e to the s. So this epsilon symbol, yeah, it's, it's misleading. Because there is also kind of ordering with respect to parity for the momenta here. So the derivation which I gave here for you, well, uh, it's clear that everything is uh, is parity invariant. So, yeah, this epsilon should be there just to, to get the right, right cut structure from, from the amplitudes. Okay, I think uh, you deserved your break, but uh, let's um, thank the speaker again.